According to a recent report on the creator economy, more than 50 million people worldwide consider themselves to be a creator. Creators aren't limited to social media either, but social media does hugely contribute to the $13.8 billion influencer industry. I'm joined today by Jane Kisnika. She goes about her business on LinkedIn, promoting services in graphic design and creating scroll-stopping content. Um, I was introduced to Jane through another social media creator. His name was Harrison Cantell. But straight away, it was very clear to me that Jane had created a personal brand, something that we're going to speak more about later in the series. Um, and it really resonates with her target audience. Jane unlocks the truth behind what it really te takes to be a content creator and also to monetize online. She goes from nothing to something, and I'm super excited to be joined by her, with her today. Uh, thanks for having me. I am super excited and nervous because this is my first time doing a live recorded um, podcast in a fancy studio. So yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for joining us. I know that you're in between sort of traveling at the moment. So yeah, yeah. So I, um, I am going to Thailand in two weeks time. Okay. Um, going to spend, I think I'm there for about two weeks and then I'm off to Bali the winter because I hate the cold so <laughs> so I'm just I'm taking off I'm like I'm packing all my bags and I'm like dumping all my stuff at my mum's and just taking a suitcase and um and taking off till next year well I know when we first spoke you were in Latvia and I had yeah. to sort of try and pin you down didn't I, to get you into the yeah. studio today so. yeah so I um I took a little holiday because I've been working like a horse for since January I mm -hmm. haven't really had a break or a holiday or anything so I um I just took two weeks off because why not, <laughs> why not? so I went back home because I'm, I'm originally from Latvia and um I went back home haven't been back home for 11 years oh wow that was that was a bit of a cultural shock <laughs> yeah I bet. um and yeah and then I went to Valencia for a week to just sit on the beach and do absolutely nothing and eat great food so it was really good <laughs> And here you are with us in London today yeah. at the studio. And then you were saying you're off to Bali next. Yes, Tha Sorry, Thailand. Thailand. Yeah, Thailand. Then... with Because you have to do a stopover. So I thought I might as well just like make a thing out of it instead of sitting in the airport for 17 hours. So. Have you been before to Thailand? Yeah, I used to live there actually. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. For three for three years, I lived in I lived in Bangkok. Some of the best years of my life, actually. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it was... Um, it was interesting. It was a lot of, it was massive, obviously, cultural shock. So I had never been to Asia when I moved out there. And, um, it was just, it was just amazing. It was just colorful and beautiful and hot and, and fun. And yeah, I just loved it. So good. Well, unintentionally, I actually went to Thailand and I went right in the middle of it. Is it called Sokran? Oh God, you <laughs> right in the middle of it. And yeah. I walked down Koh San Road and there oh, was no. water pistols and all sorts going on. Yeah, yeah. I I did I did uh, I did song crime once because it's, it's like a mental thing. Some places in Thailand they do it for like a week. Oh wow. So it's just a week you can't leave your house without being drenched in water. Like people actually carry all their phones and wards and everything in plastic bags. Um but yeah, it was loads of fun when I did do it. And that's their new year, is it? Yes. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot of it's definitely something that you wanna experience at least once. When you live there you kind of you kind of like, oh this is this again. <laughs> <laughs> I could do without getting drenched because I wanna go to the shop and, yeah. and get dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So yeah. well, Jane, I'm just gonna jump straight back straight into the whole hot topic if that's okay. Yeah. That's so fine. <laughs> We got you on the podcast today because you are literally taking LinkedIn by storm. So I hope you don't mind me saying, I know you're a very <laughs> humble individual. Um, you're getting some amazing engagement. And I know Thank we you. spoke about this sort of scroll topic, uh, scroll stopping content that you're creating. Um, I think it's really good. Obviously, you've now gone from nothing, literally nothing to 10,000 followers. We want to mm. know what your secret is. You've recently <laughs> become self-employed. Yeah. Um, so... First question. Yeah, go on. How has your approach to making money online changed since when you had zero or even a thousand followers to having, say, 5,000 or 10,000 followers now? Uh, how it has changed. So I, it hasn't changed as such. I kind of, when I first, 
I guess it's more not changed, but it's kind of just stabilized and I've kind of found my feet or found my way. Because mm. when I first started out, it, um, I was kind of trying different things. I didn't really know what to post, didn't know what's going to work, what's not going to work. And like, oh, can I go personal or I shouldn't? Because, you know, you have all the gurus online saying, oh, don't do this, don't go personal, go personal, go a bit personal. And you kind of, <laughs> you're just yeah. so confused because you're bombarded from like all sides. Um, so it took me some time to kind of figure it out what I felt comfortable with talking about. And then I just kind of realized that I like talking, I talk a lot about mental health because I've, I've had my own, my own struggles, my own journey with that. So that's a really close topic to me. <clears throat> and I love talking about it. And I realized that when I talk about things that I'm really passionate about and things that I care about and especially my, Um, personal journeys and experiences with mental health, with work, with whatever, with my Mm. career, people seem to resonate with that and people seem to respond really, really well. And I did, I remember the first post when I realized that the sort of the mental health and being mental health angle and being open and just being myself. Yeah. um, I think that was the first post that went semi-viral. Okay. Um, I got like a couple of hundred, I talked about my journey, my journey with depression and how I got on medication and how it changed my life. And that post, um, that was one of the most vulnerable things I've ever put out there. Um, and it got several hundred likes. And that was like my first, like proper, really viral post. And I was like, okay, so people actually respond well to when you're, when you just, you, when you talk about, your experiences and and what you've dealt with and just being honest and that's kind of I mean that's quite a big thing to to suddenly look at yourself and say hey do you know what I'm just going to open up to the world what what, like how does that happen when did you decide um because I it comes from the mental health thing as well I um for most of my life I kind of thought my depression was something I need to be ashamed of and I need to hide and then I did not like denied it to myself for a very long time that I don't have it. And then I once I kind of came to terms, okay, this this is my diagnosis. I kind of I need help. I need to see a doctor. I need to get my medication and everything. That was sort of sorted. And then I then I kind of hid that side still for a while. Mm. But then I realized that talking about it actually makes me process things. It makes me helps me deal with things and and yeah. thoughts and <clears throat> traumas and things like that and i and i also know that mental health isn't something that is openly st- still spoken about there's still a lot of stigma around it and i'm like damn like i've actually i've been through that i've been the one who ha- who like hides the mental health issues and who treats it like it's something really bad and then i thought you know what i want to be part of a solution not part of the problem and um I just yeah I just started opening up about those type of things and then I realized people actually respond really well to it Mm. and then I realized that it makes that it helps myself to deal with my own demons and issues and whatever childhood trauma or whatever so I'm just um kind of yeah no I I, (laughs) just well just doing me (laughs) good, good on you I mean you know to to create content that really resonates with people is a really difficult thing to do because people mm. think that when you're creating content online, there's a level of expectation and there's almost a checklist of boxes that you need to continuously tick. Yeah. You know, you have to do this, you have to do that. But actually what you're saying is you don't have to do any of that stuff. You just need to humanize your brand, which is you in this instance. Yeah, I think I think so. I think you, obviously you, can, you don't have to do what I do because um, a lot of people really don't feel comfortable about these type of things they yeah. don't want to open up about their private lives and i'm not saying that you in order to succeed you have to do that mm. but it can't help and it works for me and mm. i actually feel comfortable doing that and it sort of helps my own my own healing journey and processing and everything so um yeah even you can even you don't have to talk about very deep things in order to humanize your brand you can just I don't know, maybe every once and again show your face and <laughs> and and talk about well what you did at the weekend or just you can just you can add a bit of humanity to your brands and behind mm. it without without revealing too much. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess just bringing this back to money, you know, as we like to it's not an awkward <laughs> topic here on the podcast. We talk openly about money. Oh, no. How do you take that type of content 
that's very, very specific and very, very humanized and turn that into a, a, a channel of monetization. So how, you know, how do you really spin that around? Hey, it's now at LiveLink here. We're making it possible for creators and experts to teach anything online. It is the easiest way to monetize your audience. We'll even sort out your video editing and email marketing for you, leaving you to do what you do best, creating. LiveLink.vip, where creators and experts teach. So what I've seen works for me is that, um, so m most of my content, I'm, I'm a graphic designer, but I rarely actually talk about graphic design. I would say- Interesting. 90% of my content is just me talking about my experiences, journeys, opinions, thoughts, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, then the other 10 is to do with graphic design. And I, from what I've seen is that because I humanize myself and I engage with people and I'm very active on the platform and I'm kind of really open about yeah. various subjects and people who resonate with that, they I feel like they almost they feel like they know me and that they can relate to me and that they, they've already developed an opinion about me, that they like me and they follow me. And they trust you. And they trust me, which <laughs> yeah. is where the trust thing comes in after a while. And then, mm. and then once when I do put out the design side of things and like, I don't know, oh, look at these LinkedIn banners that I designed for my previous five clients. Yeah. I straight away, people look at it and go, oh my God, yes, love it, Jane, can you do this for me? It's like you've almost created a community, yeah. And everybody's bought into this community, both on a, um, you know, a monetization level, but also mm. on that sort of like connection level, that men mental connection. Yeah, level. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And like I've even had people who have come to me and said, um, I did a one of my first podcast um, appearances was I think back in May <laughs> or April, and um, I had someone who had listened to the podcast. And then she came to me and said, oh my God, I listened to your podcast. I absolutely loved it. I resonate with everything you said so much. Also, you're a designer and I need I need branding done for my, my business. And I really want to work with you because I really like you and I really like your vibe. So I want you to be the person who does this for me. And honestly, I have like, I have, I have a portfolio online so people can actually see some of my previous work. So it's not like, and what you're doing. yeah, there's not like, <laughs> like my profile is quite clear when you go on it, you know that I'm a designer that says it everywhere. There's examples of my work. There's links to my website. It has a bit of my portfolio on there. So people kind of form, I think that emotional connection with me through my content and then and they know that I'm a designer because I'm not, I'm quite vocal about that as well. And then once they have the need to design something or a friend of theirs says, oh, do you know a designer who, you know, I need some help with some brochures or, um, mm. or some slide decks or pitch decks, whatever. They go, oh yeah, Jane, she's yeah. great. You know, I like her content. I've been following her for X, Y, and Z. Like go, go talk to her. She, she might be able to help you. And that's kind of how it just, it just snowballs. It's that consistent branding, isn't it? Just constantly yeah. just having that message out there. And they see, yeah. you know, as soon as they need something, they think, ah, I know somebody who does that. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, you it's know. being on top of people's minds. Yeah. I've, like, I've ha I have had designers who come to me and go, oh, I've seen you have such great engagement. And like, where do you get most of your clients from? I'm trying, I'm trying, but I'm struggling. And I'm like, well, my, all my clients come from LinkedIn. Like, like every single one. I don't have any other like client sort of lead mm. generating source, everything, everything comes from LinkedIn. Yeah. And, um, and I will then look <clears throat> at these people's profiles sometimes and I can see that they haven't posted in two months. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you have to be on top of people's minds all the time. You have to post, you have, yeah. even if it's just a silly meme on a Friday, because ha you're Friday. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. If you, because you, then you show up, you're there, you're on people's feeds you make them laugh, you engage with them and you build that relationship. If you post once every two months, of course you're not gonna get clients because no one's gonna know who you are. People don't realize <laughs> how much work's involved with being a content creator. They oh think I put two or three posts Hours. out, I don't get any engagement, that's it, it's not for me. Yes. I didn't get I didn't get any I had crickets for months. Yeah. Crickets. I just in on January in January when I started, I got I had a bit of fun because I had a LinkedIn profile for mm. ten years, like most of us, I think most people my age, we have it as a, we had it as a CV. And then, um, 
I started I started following people like Leah Turner, yeah. um, Amelie Sordell. Um, I hope I pronounce her surname right. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually got her on in a couple of weeks' time. I know, you yeah, said, yeah, so, that will be really good. Yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, so I was following them and they were kind of, kind of like a big inspiration for why I started doing what I did because I saw that... Oh, really? It was Leah and Yeah, Amelia. Leah mainly and then kind of Amelia okay. came like across my... Um, feed as well yeah and um yeah I just kind of I watched how they were growing their businesses just by being them and posting on LinkedIn and I was like surely I can do this as well well you clearly <laughs> like, <laughs> well let's test that so you've got 10,000 followers right now yeah you've been what a few months would you say is fair to say you've been doing this full time so um I started posting actively Monday to Friday without fail and being on LinkedIn engaging back in January. Okay. It took probably about three, maybe four months until I started getting any actual traction okay. um, and some decent-ish um, engagement. And then I don't know what happened during the summer. It just exploded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I would say I probably accumulated the... The biggest chunk of the following, probably about six thousand followers in the last three or so months. Okay, so it's been yeah quite quite recent. Yeah, so you're at ten thousand now. I saw your post very recently. Yeah. What does? <laughs> how much money do you make as a creator with ten thousand followers? Um, so it's a it's a tricky one because um, I only went um, I went fully freelance in September, so it's been like twenty eight days. <laughs> Okay. Cool. Um, I had a, I've I had a full time job up yeah. until that point because I wanted to make sure I can make enough money before it's I ditched the job. Yeah. Um, but I I have probably made in the last three three four months I've made about ten grand. Wow. So you're averaging about three thousand. Yeah. Per month. Roughly. Yeah. And that and that was me doing it part time because I still had a full time job. So mm. I was working for for my full time job from nine till five and then doing that, doing my design stuff as a freelancer on the side in the mornings and in the evening, so. So I'm, I'm keen to understand whether that's um, directly linked with the amount of followers and the amount of engagement you get. So I guess at the beginning when you had 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 followers versus now that you've got 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 followers, are you finding that the majority of your earnings have come from uh, the, the time period that you had the higher audience? Or is yeah, it more abs- from... Absolutely. Yeah. The, um, the, the income and the clients started growing the more followers I had, okay. the more exposure I had, and the more, um, I've, you know, I've done some, some stuff for some bigger creators and they've left me recommendations. <laughs> and so I kind of get that social proof as well from other bigger creators. So I think that kind of shows people like, oh, well, if this person, they have 60,000 followers and she, they worked with her, then she must be good because I'm sure they wouldn't otherwise. So it kind of, um, I've developed those relationships with bigger creators as well, which I think has really helped. Um, but yeah, definitely the more, the more the audience grows, the more the work comes in. Yeah. And the more, the more I charge, the more I can bring my prices up because I'm getting busy and there's only one of me. So Good on you. I don't blame you. I mean, you're doing exceptionally well. So thank you. you Congratulations. Um, thank you. So, LiveLink, we believe that everybody has something to teach, okay? <laughs> so, when was that moment that you realized that you had something valuable to offer or to teach? Was there sort of like a light bulb moment where you thought, ha, huh, I can do this. I do not need to be working for somebody else. I've got something that I can offer the world. <laughs> um, I think it was... So my, my original thought plan when I, when I started my whole LinkedIn journey was... I'm going to start posting. I'm going to see where this goes. Um, and I was like, I want to do design freelance. I want to be my own boss. But I was in my head, it's going to be maybe between 18 months to two years mm-hmm. when I get to the point where I can quit my job and kind of have that stability and that social proof from clients and people where I feel comfortable just ditching a comfortable job in London. So did, um, sorry to interrupt. Did you make money before you quit your job, or did you make? Was it out only after your job job quitting that you started to make that money? Oh no, I started making money while I was still working. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I started. Uh, I think my first 
first proper client was sometime in March, maybe. Okay. When I got a when I got my first client from LinkedIn, and then it's usually you get the first one is the hardest one. Then when you get the first one, then it kind of like snowballs yeah, yeah. slowly, okay. and then um, I had I was having a few clients here and there, but nothing too too crazy. And I was like, okay, well, this maybe it's not going to take me two years to do this. Maybe it. It's going to be a bit less, but I was still kind of in my head. I was like, okay, it will be at least 12 months where I feel comfortable yeah. from the amount of work that I have coming in that I can quit my job and focus on that full time. And then in June, around June time, things had just exploded and I realized that I'm not sleeping, that I'm literally getting up at 6 a.m. To work. To work. I was doing I was doing my thing and then I started my job, uh, my full time job. Yeah. Um, worked till 5.30, then had half an hour break and then got back to my freelance clients and worked till like 11 o'clock midnight. Mm. And that's when sort of the light bulb moment happened where I was like, hey, I can do this. People actually like, they engage with my content and they love what I put out and they they resonate with me and they, my thought process and me as a person don't know why, but anyway. <laughs> well, I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> and, um, and then it just kind of went, yeah, like, I realized that, yeah, anyone can, I don't know, use Canva, for example. Anyone can download the app and, mm-hmm. and slap some things on, on the artboard, but it doesn't mean it's going to be good. No, it doesn't true. mean that it's going to be aesthetically pleasing and, and, you know, there's so much that goes into design that even – that not everyone has that skill to everyone can have the skill to produce something on Canva or whatever other software, but it doesn't mean that they have the skill to produce good stuff. Mm. And that, that was kind of the moment where I was like, okay, I'm actually, I seem to be quite good at this. People like what I do. I'm working stupid hours <laughs> every day like I didn't I would I don't think I had a break I didn't have like a weekend day off for like three months so were you very confident at that stage that you could monetize yeah you, you can get you can quit your job yeah I'm now confident that I can go online mm-hmm. and make money make yeah. more more money than more, what you're making yeah. yeah absolutely I've I've I had two weeks off in September so I haven't I haven't been making that much in September <laughs> you've been enjoying <laughs> I mean, yourself though I've been yeah. seeing your posts <laughs> so but I, I know that I can probably double my the, sa- the salary that I... I'm currently at a point where I'm making probably slightly more than I did at my full-time job. Um, I reckon in six months' time when I properly yeah, like put myself into it and put, put time into business development because I haven't actually done it. I haven't done any business development like consciously. It's just all happens and mm. people just kind of seem to come to me and book calls and yeah. <laughs> just through through LinkedIn my content I had a call with someone today who literally messaged me on LinkedIn oh hey I saw your post um um I need some help to design some brochures and stuff can we jump on a call and go over it I'm like yeah great <laughs> yeah <amazing>. sure <laughs> yeah. of course we can um so I, so I guess you were at work then when you went from nothing to something yeah. and then it was only when you quit your job and you started to gain the followers that you went from something to life-changing I guess is the aim yeah yeah Are so you somewhere in the middle of that at the moment yeah so I I only quit my job I only I've literally been fully freelance my own boss for a month like 28 days That's amazing <laughs> I quit congratulations thank you yeah, yeah. um but yeah it was it was elite it took about six months to kind of get there and then in the summer, I was like, okay, I have so many clients. I'm literally making the same amount as I am on my full time job, mm. but I need sleep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't keep going like this because like it's overrated. It's fine. Don't. <laughs> I get very triggered when people say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Caffeine. No. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and that's when I was like, you know what? I need to quit my job, and I just need to give this a shot yeah. because I'm doing well, and I'm not. Tr- I'm, my whole thing is why I felt so comfortable quitting my job was because I I wasn't trying hard to get clients. I wasn't putting a lot of energy into business development and connecting with new people. And I'm doing networking and I'm talking to people, but it's all kind of very, very organic. Okay. It's not very, it's not structured. I know people have like this, I get up at seven, I go on LinkedIn, I connect with 10 people in my ideal clients. We trick the algorithm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all that stuff. All that. I don't, I don't do any of that. I haven't even gotten to that. <clears throat> and then I was thinking, if I'm doing so well now without even trying very hard and without promoting my work actively, what's going to happen? I'm going to be fine when I'm, when I go freelance because then I'll actually have time to put into business development, into getting new leads, getting new clients. So if I'm doing fine now, why wouldn't I be when I have more time to dedicate to it? It's, it sounds like you're in demand and actually how you scale, I suppose, <laughs> is your next next big issue, isn't it? Is how, oh, how do I, yeah. how do I, you know, scale myself, you know? So that's potentially something for you to consider. Yeah, I, I don't know yet. I still need to... I, Clo- cloning works, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need a few more on yeah. me. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see. I am thinking about some digital products and courses in the future, but... What are you looking at, if you don't mind me asking? Is there anything in particular? Not yet. No? I haven't... I, I think it might be something to do some sort of course that helps small business owners and solopreneurs to understand design better and design better content for themselves if they can't afford a designer because I understand a lot of people don't have several hundred pounds to spend on you know some brochures and logo design and things like that but I think if the information was a bit more simplified and Mm. easier accessible in one place okay here are like 10 less 10 10 minute lessons that you need to know about design to design better Mm. on your own yeah I think something like that might work but I kind of that's it's just brain brainstorming watch this space (laughs) (laughs) so where does that inspiration to create unique content come from every day because there's only so many times you can talk about (laughs) i don't know you know how your day went or how yesterday went or how last month went like every single time i see one of your posts on linkedin it seems like it's truly unique i hope you don't mind me saying that no no thank you i I appreciate you saying that where does jane even think this stuff up like is where does it come from and and just a follow-on question from that just to chuck this at you as well do you measure the success of any particular post and think that's the one that helped me to monetize or that's the one that got me the business is there a style of post no not really no i just kind of freestyle and hope for the best yeah so you couldn't like (laughs) pinpoint the style of content no like i know i know in like overall i know that um personalized content does well um, I know that adding a selfie or a picture of yourself to the content improves the reach and improves the engagement because people like seeing the face behind the content. But and you're um, the brand as well in this instance. Yeah, it's a personal brand, yeah. isn't it? So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I don't, I don't have, I don't have a strategy. I don't have a template for how I write my posts. I just follow um, some guidance. Like I know I need. Like I keep my paragraphs short. I I do a lot of white space, so it's easier to read and skim reads. You know, if it's a bullet pointed thing, I'll use em- emojis to kind of bring a bit of color in there and separate it out from the rest of the text. So there's a little bits and things that I do, um, but there's no real sort of no proof behind the pudding. No, no, I just <laughs> I just post and it works and sometimes it flops and I'm like, well, it flopped. I'll do better tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but with regards to your first question about where the ideas come from, I just, I have a lot going on in my head, <laughs> first of all. Um, and I, I read a lot. I consume a lot of content. I think the key to being able to produce a lot of content is to consuming a lot of content. Just absorb it. Yeah, because I um, I try to take I take inspiration from a lot of things. I keep I have like on my notes fo- um, notes app on my phone. There's a list of just content ideas. If, I'll, if I'm scrolling through LinkedIn and I see someone has posted something and I go, oh, that's actually really interesting. Love that. I could actually like take some of those bits and create a post for myself. So I'll like snapshot it or write up the idea really quickly. So sometimes if I am feeling um, not as creative on the day, I'll literally just go into my notes app and just scroll through everything and go, oh yeah, I can I can easily like type this up in 10 minutes. Do you know what was interesting? You put a post up last night, didn't you, about your coming here today? Yes, yeah. <laughs> and it did, well, I thought it did extremely well because you you put out the fact that we were going live 
and it was like dun 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 <laughs> you know like we're going live <laughs> what are these guys crazy like and you mm. were talking about coming out of your comfort zone and then again you were really talking about things that were quite personal to you so i'm coming out of my comfort zone this year's all about making change and doing yeah. x y and z and I could see straight away people really resonated with that. I mean, the, if we're talking about call to actions, the call to action of that post was ask me some questions that Damien can ask me on the on the podcast today. Yeah. But actually, it just turned into I hope you I hope you smash it, do really yeah. well, like all the best. <laughs> and it was really nice to see that. Like, there's yeah. a clear, strong community that you've created. Ab- absolutely, like the people are so supportive. I've never I've never felt so much support from in a way, bunch of strangers. <laughs> yeah, nice. There's a lot, a lot of the people, I talk to them a lot on in, on LinkedIn and comments through DMs. Some of, some of them I've done virtual coffees with. Most of them I've never met in real life. So I don't, yeah. I, I don't really know them, but they're all, everyone's just so, so supportive and just, just like a whole bunch of cheerleaders <laughs> it's <laughs> which so is nice. it's really it's really nice it really is nice i've never experienced anything like that so it is quite um quite quite amazing really <laughs> yeah no it, it's great it, it just comes back to that point about the style excuse me the style of content that you put out there mm. and when you put out that personal content that really resonates with people and quite frankly talking about your feelings People really sort of tune in with that. And I was quite impressed yeah. with the level of engagement you got off the back of that. So Yeah, I think because every, everyone everyone goes through that, don't they? They We all go th- through uncomfortable situations. We all have imposter syndrome. We all have ego. We all mm. have mental health. We all, we all deal with more or less the same things and go through the same things. So I think... When I try to squeeze in those little bits of personal experiences and feelings that resonates with people, because they go, "Yeah, I get you. I feel you. I know yeah. what that's like." <laughs> oh, it's not just me that experiences that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. so cool. Well, I'm going to just. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to jump through these questions. <laughs> um, I could talk to you forever, by the way. So. Yeah, same. I, <laughs> so, I, yeah, I could go on yeah, for the, yeah. about this for hours. <laughs> but the most popular platform at the moment for um, content creators, it will probably come as no surprise for anybody, is very much so over the last 18 months in particular, TikTok Mm -hmm. um, and Instagram, Mm -hmm. you chose LinkedIn. So my question to you is, (laughs) why did you choose LinkedIn as a platform to monetize from? Um, What was it about that that drew you in? So I tried Instagram. Mm -hmm. No shades towards Instagram, but it didn't work for me. Okay. I, um, I tried Instagram for about six months. Uh, it, I found it very time consuming because obviously Instagram is highly visual. Mm-hmm. So I would spend two, three hours on creating a carousel or, you know, researching a subject and then creating a carousel or a design or whatever. And it got tiny engagement because organic reach on Instagram is pretty much non-existent these days. And, um, yeah. Unless you you have put in the legwork and you have the following, and then obviously it, it snowballs. But it's really because it's so saturated; it's really really hard to get there. Mm. And I I tried for six months, again posting every day, showing up, commenting, trying to talk to people, trying to build relationships, and none of it stuck. None of it worked, and all I got was just people. Anyone who I would start a conversation with that seemed like a genuine conversation would turn out into being some coach who wants to sell me something. Yeah. And then okay. you, you could pick up on the questions when they start like asking, so what are the things that you're struggling with in your business? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> so it was just like a roadblock every time. Yeah. And I just, I felt like I couldn't genuinely connect with anyone. I wasn't building any relationships. I wasn't getting any traction, any engagement. I've never had any, a single lead from LinkedIn. I'm uh, sorry, LinkedIn, Instagram. <laughs> okay. And then, as I said, I, um, I started sort of noticing Leah and Emily and um, Amelia, sorry, and um, seeing how well they're doing and how sort of saw how they talked about LinkedIn and how well it's working for them and what it's doing for them. And I went, you know what, I might as well try this. Because I, I, 
I've realized I actually like telling stories and Instagram is because it's so visual. It's hard to do the storytelling in the way that I like. And, and LinkedIn's long form as well. Yeah, isn't it? So exactly, that's exactly. <laughs> um, so I thought I might as well try this and see how this works for me because there seems to be a lot of people who are doing a lot with LinkedIn. They're getting a lot of organic reach and engagement and everything. So I thought I might as well try and see what happens. And I tried it and um, yeah, within six months, it changed my life. So. Here we are, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because the style of content you're putting on LinkedIn <clears throat> is significantly different to the style of content that uh, creators are putting on TikTok who are monetizing. Mm. You know, the style of reels on TikTok, you know, eight to 10 second reels, spiral out of control, making a load of cash off the back yeah. of brand deals and things like that. It's just, um, I guess it's really just about your target market and who that, who, and who are they and where, what do they look like and where do they hang out? And it's clear from what you've told me that your target market are very much on LinkedIn. They're very Absolutely. much with a personal brand. Yeah, like I feel like, I don't know, I might be wrong because I don't, I don't follow the stats and all that sort of stuff, but I feel like a TikTok attracts a lot younger generation um, and my my clients are people who are in, I would say, early 30s and up. So they're more more mature, more business orientated, and it's just a totally different demographic. And that's the sort of people I res- resonate with, people who resonate with me. I, I know that the younger generation thinks that LinkedIn is lame and, and like for old people. <laughs> so I literally had a conversation with my friend today and she's, um, she's in university. She's a bit younger than me and she's trying to get into LinkedIn as well. Cause she's seeing how well I'm doing. She's like, Ooh, I'm, maybe I need to do this as well. And she spoke to someone from her university, uh, who I think the person's probably early twenties. And they're like, Oh no, LinkedIn is just, no one goes on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Sh- Sorry. (laughs) 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 I knew it's going to happen at some point, you know. um, Yeah, LinkedIn is this, LinkedIn is for old people, LinkedIn's boring and all this. And I'm just sitting there and thinking LinkedIn is literally like the new creator platform. (laughs) The the, things happen on LinkedIn. And if you're not on LinkedIn, you're not posting, you're not engaging, you're not building that personal brand. You are missing out massively because the organic reach will stop. It will stop at some point it won't be as easy as to now. build it as it is as it is now i reckon probably another year and two or two and it's not gonna be <clears throat> as easy as it is now um but in terms of people. Like monetization for you very much linkedin without linkedin where do you think you would be i would still be working for the business i worked for up until yes. end of august so 100 percent of your income right now is coming from linkedin mm-hmm. Amazing. All of it, yeah. All the, the whole thing. Amazing. <laughs> Which is kind of scary. I need, I need to diversify that. <laughs> Maybe, but it also just tells us that the style of content that you're doing really works. Mm. You know, and it really shows that that style of content on LinkedIn works as well. That sort yeah. of personal, community-based content. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I think it's all LinkedIn. Is I call LinkedIn a community-building platform, and I haven't seen that sort of thing happen on any other platform at least not for me or anyone else that i personally know so mm. yeah it's um it's quite magical yeah <laughs> i like magic <laughs> i do too <laughs> final question i promise okay and maybe i'll ask one more after this we'll <laughs> go <see>. on <laughs> so i recently read an article on sprout social um okay. it basically describes creators with less than fifteen thousand followers as micro influencers so that's how they sort of define mm-hmm. them now I'm going to take LinkedIn out of the equation for a moment because I actually think that somebody with 15,000 followers on LinkedIn is not a micro-influencer. I think it's a slightly different definition on LinkedIn. Um, But one thing that's really interesting is that creators that fall into this category are benchmark as having a higher engagement rate. So essentially what they're saying is that creators that have a lower following have a higher engagement than creators that have a higher following. So what that actually does is it starts to attract brands to those creators because especially smaller brands right because they Mm -hmm. can then use that uh, content or that content creator to boost their engagement have you found that you are attracting those types of clients small businesses because of the amount of engagement you're getting or is there a is there a definitive reason that they are coming to you as 
what Sprout Social would describe as a micro influencer. I hate that word. <laughs> what influencer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or micro? <laughs> Both. The, the combination yeah. of the two. Okay. Um, I I personally haven't had anyone like come to me in for like a brand deal or anything like that. That has not happened. But I think people, smaller businesses and solopreneurs and so on, they come to me because I am very active and I am all over LinkedIn all the time. (laughs) So they see me a lot. They see my face. They see my content. They see other people engaging with my content. And I think that's that sort of helps me being be found by other people um and i think with bigger creators especially the ones who start hitting like 20 30 40 100 thousand followers all that um i know their followers for example like leah who still answers every single comment and she's great yeah. um still engages even though she has like i think 160 thousand followers on smashing yeah <laughs> insane yeah. <laughs> um but i feel like a lot of the bigger accounts they I feel like they get lazy when it comes to engagement and actually engaging with their audience because they just live off the fact that they have the big following and then so it naturally drop hey it's now at live link here we're making it possible for creators and experts to teach anything online it is the easiest way to monetize your audience we'll even sort out your video editing and email marketing for you leaving you to do what you do best creating Living.vip, where creators and experts teach. Yeah, because I, I sometimes land on people on people's profiles and they have like 30, 40,000 followers and their latest post the day before had 30 likes and 10 comments. Yeah. And I, I feel like, I don't know how the algorithm works or whatever, but I it might be just that people notice that when they engage with this person, this person doesn't engage back and isn't really part of the community anymore because they're just kind of living off the fact that they have the huge following and it just kind of it makes them the money on its own and they don't have to put in the work anymore um so that might be reason i don't know that's just me speculating no, I, think, I think it's probably a mixture of that but i also suspect suspect that it is the algorithm as well depending on obviously the platform that you're using but it's a really interesting point you know what's the point in me engaging with this individual if i never get anything yeah. back you know, because so. we all have egos we all like when we're seen when we're heard and even if you i i know for example i um i love um jay jay shetty who's um he's a massive wellness pers- person guru whatever you want to call him he has one of the best wellness podcasts in the world and and okay. very successful book and everything and i remember when i when i read his book i did a post about it because it really helped me through covid and the lockdown and everything and i did a post about it on my instagram and i tagged him in it and he's someone i don't know how he has millions of followers now I don't yeah. know. <laughs> like he's a massive account yeah um and he he commented on that post and it made me oh, feel amazing. so good and so seen and and I know it was it was probably an assistant or whatever, but because I, I doubt that he just sits there and has time to answer two hundreds and thousands of comments every day. He might do. He he I'm sure he does some of it, but I'm like I'm not I'm not completely like thinking it was definitely him, but just the fact that that account did respond to my little post saying how much I loved the book and how grateful I was made me feel really good. Mm. So I know that when other people comment on my content, it feels good when I respond. It feels good when I acknowledge them, when I like their posts, when I engage back, when I ask a question. And it's just it's just feeding the other person's ego in a in a small way because it makes them makes them feel good that they're being seen. Oh. And I guess it <clears throat> sort of ties in with this idea of community that you mentioned before. Yeah, right? Like exactly, being yeah. part of a community, it's not mute. You yeah, know, people yeah. help each it's other. It's not out. one way. It's not me talking in people. It's no. me talking with people and no. engaging with them and supporting them. And, and I guess anyway. as a sort of a take-home message then, that ultimately leads, because we are focused on monetization at the moment with content creators, mm. I guess that to sort of bring it all in, the level of engagement that you give to your users, that community feel that you've created, that personal brand that people can resonate with, the fact that you open up about 
everything literally <laughs> is probably the reason there's a fine line yeah <laughs> but that's probably the reason why you're able to monetize as successfully as you have been doing i think would so. be the takeaway i've sort of had from this yeah i think i think so i'm um, that that that's so that's sort of how I feel and what I have gathered from the con- the type of content I put out and um, how things have been for me in the last few months. Um, I don't know, maybe some a LinkedIn expert needs to analyze my content and, t- and they might be able to tell me more. But yeah, I think it's it's definitely that. It's so, part of it. Yeah. Well, Jane. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I am going to draw an end to the, to the interview now. But <laughs> That's fine. one thing that I will say is that you are, it's very clear that you're genuinely helping a lot of people, <clears throat> both in business and it sounds like quite personally as well. So mm. um, do keep doing what you're doing. We think it's amazing. We're going to continue to follow you <laughs> and engage with you. We expect the same engagement back. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, thank you very much for joining us and you're welcome anytime with, with us here at LiveLink. Oh, thank you so much. I, right. I love this. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Take care. Take care. <laughs>